See that? We can see your screen. Okay. Go for Perfect. it. So hi, my name is Olivia Rice, um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about adult native joint septic arthritis. I have no disclosures on the talk. So first today, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what we do and what we believe and what we see. I wanna use that information um, to enlighten you with some practical additions to your evaluation and workup of adults with possible native joint septic arthritis and discuss some additional treatment options and future directions as well. So many of you are familiar with the frequently preached and practiced principles um, of septic arthritis, diagnosis, management, and treatment listed here. Some of these principles include um, native joint septic arthritis uh, is an orthopedic surgical emergency and needs to be diagnosed and treated promptly. The diagnosis and management starts with evaluation of clinical signs and symptoms in addition to arthrocentesis of the affected joint. For synovial fluid analysis, uh, we typically order a cell count, crystals, and gram stain, as well as a culture. If the nucleated cell count is over 50,000 cells, uh, we tell our senior or attending on call and make a presumptive diagnosis of septic arthritis. Urgent treatment ensues and typically consists of irrigation and debridement for an arthroscopic or open approach. Finally, we consult our infectious disease colleagues to help us to initiate uh, and treat patients with systemic antibiotics. These beliefs are so commonly referred to that they have come to become the default mode of operation for many of us when thinking and evaluating native joint septic arthritis. So throughout this talk, we'll come back to these beliefs frequently and evaluate them critically in reference to published literature. And so I want to um, just specify that the focus of this talk today is gonna to be specifically for adult patients with single native joint infections, not related to recent surgeries. First, a little bit of context and background info. And as many of you know, it doesn't happen every day, but septic arthritis is something that all of you have likely diagnosed and treated at some point in your practice. It's cited to occur in five to 10 um, per 100,000 adults every year and appears to be on the rise. Septic arthritis possesses a bimetal incidence as well with peaks in both childhood and adults over the age of 55 years. The knee is the principal target for bacterial septic arthritis with over 45% of septic arthritis cases in adults evolving the knee. Other commonly affected large joints of the appendicular skeleton include the hip, ankle, shoulder, and elbow. Some commonly seen small joints include the MCPs or IPs joints of the fingers. So just a little anatomy review um, as it will come in, uh, it'll be important to think about later as we discuss treatment options. The articular surfaces of synovial joints are composed of hyaline cartilage. And as you can see on the right, um, it's composed of both chondrocytes and collagen, which is responsible for the resorptive capacity um, in order to accumulate water content uh, due to these proteoglycans. The non-articulating surfaces of the joints are covered by a thin synovial membrane composed of a surface intimal layer, which is cellular, and the subintimal layer, which is neurovascular. The vascular layer actually has potential for angiogenesis and can accrue inflammatory cell infl infiltrate during inflammation. These cells can comprise of layers of macrophage cells involved in the immune response, as well as fibroblasts, which secrete synovial fluid. The synovial fluid uh, contains hyaluronin and is secreted by uh, fibroblast-like cells, as well as um, lubricin, which is a proteoglycan, and which is secreted by surface chondrocytes. Synovial fluid itself is actually uh, partly composed of interstitial fluid filtered from the blood plasma as well. And this occurs via hydrostatic and osmotic pressure differentials between capillary plasma and synovial fluid. It's important to remember that the cartilage itself is avascular. So the synovial fluid is responsible for nourishing all of the chondrocytes within the cartilage via diffusion. This results in very slow meta metabolic environments. And this re results in a slow basal rate of chondrocyte proliferation and apoptosis when compared to other connective tissues. And this is also the main reason why cartilage has such poor healing potential. So when we think of a native joint septic infection, what are some risk factors that are, that are known to cause this? Excluding the risk factors for surgical site infection and um, related to surgical site infection and PJI, some of the risk factors for native joint septic arthritis um, for you to keep in mind as you're evaluating patients include increasing age, 
uh, which typically coincides with pre-existing joint diseases, including arthritis of any kind. But in particular, RA has, has an especially high um, risk of occurring a septic infection. Other risk factors include IV drug use. And then of course, all of the systemic uh, diseases that uh, can disrupt your ability to fight infection, including uncontrolled HIV, alcoholism, and diabetes, as well as local factors such as an overlying skin disruption or, or nearby infection. So the etiology of native joint infections. In a retrospective study done by Morgan et al., more than 70% of septic arthritis cases were shown to be caused by hematogenous seeding. Other means of entry include direct introduction by penetrating trauma or injections, uh, local spread from neighboring inflamed or infected tissues, and sometimes due to closed blunt trauma of the joint or nearby structures in isolation. How the initial foci of bacteria comes into existence is not always clear. To demonstrate this, uh, we'll, we'll review a case, a 79-year-old male with no significant past medical history who presented to the ED about two weeks after a minor MVC. He stated that he was a passenger in the car and was holding on tight to the overhead handle uh, when, when the car that hit them sort of barely nicked them. And he thinks that he was just bracing himself um, and uh, jolted and resulted in a massive rotator cuff tear, which he was pretty sure of himself at the time. He was actually scheduled to see an Ortho Carolina provider uh, the, in the upcoming week. But prior to that appointment, he began developing this worsening shoulder pain, swelling and erythema over his right shoulder and arm, which you can see here in this picture on the left. He presented to the outside hospital uh, where they obtained the CT and drew blood cultures. And actually the CT was read um, at the outside hospital as concerning for necrotizing soft tissue infection, which was the original reason he was, he was transferred to CMC and, and we were consulted. When he got here, uh, we proceeded with an MRI because he was generally stable and the clinical picture was a little confusing. The MRI images, uh, you can see it here on the right. And what they showed was extensive soft tissue edema, as well as a full thickness and retracted subscap and supraspinatus rotator cuff tear. Most interestingly, he, he also had this intramuscular fluid collection within the supraspinatus that communicated with the subdeltoid bursa and glenohumeral joint through the rotator cuff tear. The MRI read um, was discussed with an MSKI radiologist who wasn't particularly concerned about infection actually. And especially in the setting of subacute trauma, it seemed more like hematoma um, and just general trauma that was uh, causing the findings on the MRI. So we decided to perform an arthrocentesis of the right shoulder in hopes to rule out infection of the glenohumeral joint. But before the cell count from the aspirate could even result, the outside hospital called reporting that his blood cultures were positive for Staph aureus. Taking all this information into consideration, we opted to urgently take him uh, to the OR for irrigation and debridement. His aspirate and osinovial tissue cultures obtained interoperatively also resulted positive for Staph aureus. So common things being common, uh, Staph aureus accounts for about 60 to 70% of septic arthritis cases, and has been shown to cause more severe infection than other microbes. Once inside, the bacteria will employ different virulence factor factors, which you can see in this diagram on the right. They attach to host tissue and proliferate, while the host immune system will respond to the invading bacteria. Of note, um, contamination of jo joint aspirate cultures does happen. However, it is most likely due to coagulase negative staph, uh, which you don't see listed here on the most common path pathogens. Uh, coag negative staph is a ubiquitous skin uh, microbe, but rarely actually causes septic arthritis. And that's because it, has, it does not have the required virulence factors uh, like staph aureus does to induce infection within the joint. So as soon as the bacteria reach the joint cavity, a rapid immune response is triggered. And it has been shown that the destruction of joints in Staph aureus septic arthritis is not only caused by the invading microbes, but also to cells and molecules of the immune system involving both innate and adaptive immunity. This diagram here is a highly simplified and hypothetical scheme of host bacterium interactions during Staphylococcus arthritis. As you can imagine, um, if this is the simplified scheme, the reality is quite complex. Unfortunately, the mortality rate associated with NJSA ranges from 10 to 15% and has been constant over the past decade. The cause of death is typically due to systemic sepsis. The natural history of septic arthritis has been demonstrated primarily in animal models. Keep in mind that these models are imperfect as their goal is to keep the animal alive without giving them antibiotics, especially in this case. 
but infecting them with enough bacteria in the joint to cause septic arthritis. So in this animal study out of Denmark in the 1980s, 85 rabbits had their knees injected with Staph aureus and were given any treatment and were not given any treatment in order to study the time-related changes of untreated septic arthritis for up to three months. Clinical signs like fever, a hot tender joint and swelling were pronounced after two days. A loss of up to a quarter of the body weight occurred during the first two weeks. And by three weeks, a 120 degree flexion contracture in the knee's resting position was apparent in all rabbits. Throughout the study, they sacrificed a few rabbits throughout um, each week in order to visibly inspect the cartilage for damage. They saw a marginal erosion of the cartilage border beginning on day five, continually, continuing gradually to the total joint destruction after five weeks. And they used this histologic uh, histochemical scoring scale seen here on the right. So in adults, um, there are a few factors that um, influence the morbidity of the disease. And in Neonates and infants, uh, they, they have quite severe um, disease process and as, a, as long, or sorry, as well as sequelae and poor outcomes. Younger children actually tend to do a little bit better um, with high overall rates of success. Um, again, once getting a little bit older to, to the children, adolescents have higher incidence of sequelae uh, compared to the younger children and adults have varying treatment outcomes. One thing that, that is very clear in the literature is that elderly patients tend to do worse compared to the, everybody else. In terms of the types of sequelae uh, that occur despite treatment, uh, a study by Lopper uh, evaluated how time to diagnosis and treatment influences outcomes following NJSA. And the sequelae seen in this study include osteoarthritis or arthrosis, uh, persistent pain at last follow-up, a requirement for a girdle stone hip procedure in the setting of hip septic arthritis, uh, arthrodesis or fusion, um, amputation and stiffness, as well as chronic re regional pain syndrome. It's important to note here that this list does not include unplanned or planned additional surgical interventions during the initial hospitalization period uh, for treatment, which are considered to some uh, treatment failure as well. So just before we uh, get started in reviewing some of the literature regarding diagnostic tests, I wanna give a brief refresher on diagnostic accuracy. So some General rules of thumb, the likelihood ratio is the likelihood that a given test result would be expected in a patient with a target disorder compared to the likelihood that the same result would be expected in the patient without the target disorder. So it's used to assess how good a diagnostic test is and to help in selecting an appropriate diagnostic test or a sequence of tests when evaluating patient. A likelihood ratio greater than one is often labeled as a positive likelihood ratio and produces a post-test probability that is higher than the pre-test probability, thereby increasing your suspicion that the patient has a target disorder uh, when, the, when, results, when resulted. For a positive likelihood ratio, the higher the value, the more helpful that test is in increasing your suspicion for the disease. Likewise, a likelihood ratio less than one is often labeled um, as a negative likelihood ratio and produces a post-test probability lower than the pre-test probability, thereby decreasing your suspicion that the patient has the target disorder. The closer this value is to zero, the more helpful that test can be in lowering your suspicion for disease. So when working a patient up uh, for potential native joint septic arthritis, there's a few other uh, differential diagnoses to keep in mind, uh, including rheumatoid arthritis or an acute flare of, of rheumatoid arthritis, crystalline arthropathy, including gout and pseudogout, PVNS, hemoarthrosis, and non, a non-inflammatory non effusion due to OA, and intraarticular injury. Some other do not miss diagnoses to consider include malignancy and avian. So similar to the diagnostic workup for most medical problems, we start with the history and physical. While interviewing the patient about their history, we are really searching for risk factors. On exam, you're trying to connect the symptoms patient is describing to the objective findings that you see with your own eyes clinically. Often infection and, and or inflammatory labs are ordered before we're even consulted in an attempt to help us rule out septic arthritis. Our role as orthopedic surgeons typically involves performing an arthrocentesis and walking the synovial fluid sample to the lab with orders for cell count and differential, crystal detection and analysis, and most importantly, gram stain and culture. The one caveat to routine arthrocentesis in an initial workup 
worth mentioning is the case of small joints, especially if they warrant intervention based on clinical presentation and patient history alone. For example, this 51-year-old female I saw was admitted a few days prior to consultation for an epidural abscess that neurosurgery had dra drained semi-urgently due to neurologic changes. By the time we were consulted, the patient had a fixed deformity at the PIP joint of her left small finger, like you can see here, with the overlying skin changes and x-rays uh, seen as well. So as you can see, uh, there's, on the x-rays, there's some subluxation of the small finger PIP joint in, in the right hand films, along with the disappearance of the joint space. This is actually a very specific sign of uh, native joint septic arthritis in the finger. However, it's a very late, uh, a sign of late stage of disease. What's also interesting about uh, this patient's presentation is the presence of a septic uh, boutonniere deformity, which you can see here. Um, and the reason, that was the reason that the clinical presentation was so convincing of septic arthritis. Because in fact, uh, the septic boutonniere deformity is very specific uh, for pyogenic arthritis of the PIP joint. And what happens in this is that an intraarticular collection of purulence reaches a volume that can no longer be retained within the joint. And the joint is so well supported pulmonarly by the volar plate, which blends with the collateral ligaments on the sides, which are all thick and unyielding. And therefore the, the purulent material escapes dorsally through the thin dorsal capsule. And finally, the central slip is attenuated or eroded, allowing the lateral bands to slip volarward, resulting in the classic boutonniere deformity. Okay, so let's take a step back for a minute and walk through the basic diagnostic workup previously outlined. So classically, when we think of patients with uh, a single joint native septic arthritis, the following picture comes to mind. A middle-aged patient presents to the ED with increasing knee pain over the past few days. No recent history of trauma, has some osteoarthritis at baseline, but nothing severe. He may or may not have a remote history of gout. Um, he's not sure. On exam, you know that their knee is warm, has some overlying erythema like the picture demonstrates here. And they're, they're having a lot of difficulty ranging the knee passively or actively due to severe pain and stiffness. As we discussed when we outlined our current beliefs, uh, the synovial white blood cell count um, is typically referenced in terms of helping us figure out an early diagnosis for uh, septic arthritis. A study by Long et al. provided some general categories, uh, which are fairly consistent throughout the literature that help differentiate various types of synovial fluid findings into different disease states. They do warn though that the results of the aspiration, um, while they do assist with the, determining the etiology of joint effusion, they also have a lot of overlapping findings between categories. However, they also advocate that synovial culture is the single most important test and should be prioritized on all patients uh, from whom synovial fluid is collected. Unfortunately, uh, synovial fluid cultures um, are only positive in about 80% of uh, true septic arthritis cases. The remaining 20% um, of cases with a false negative culture, uh, which they speculate is due to a variety of reasons, including early disease states, which may represent small number of bacteria present within the joint um, or a low amount of synovial fluid that was able to be um, aspirated. Arthrocentesis that's performed one to two days after initiation of systemic antibiotics or poor sampling or planning technique. They recommend to decrease the likelihood of false negative synovial cultures, uh, um, obtain the highest amount of synovial fluid possible, as well as plate the cultures and blood culture bottle, bottles to increase the sensitivity. So like all infection related challenges in orthopedic surgery, accurate diagnosis is both extremely important and also very challenging. So most studies list a positive culture as a gold standard for diagnosis of septic arthritis. However, as we're well aware, this result may take several days. So in order to proceed with the treatment in a timely manner, we often use the synovial fluid analysis to guide our clinical decision-making. Rasmussen et al. aptly stated that it's traditionally accepted that a synovial fluid, fluid cell count of 50,000 cells or higher isolated from the native joint is diagnostic of septic arthritis with lower counts suggestive of a crystalline or inflammatory arthropathy. Diagnosis according to these clear-cut textbook definitions seems so straightforward, right? Uh, and according to the diagnostic accuracy studies that we'll review, they seem to work pretty well at helping us rule septic arthritis in or out. 
But one of the reasons I became interested in this in, in investigating this topic to begin with was because every time I was consulted to rule out native joint septic arthritis on call, the clinical presentation and even the synovial fluid analysis never seemed this easy to interpret. To demonstrate this, uh, how, the, how the lines between differential diagnoses are so easily blurred, um, I'll use this example of an 87-year-old female I saw a few months ago who presented to the ED with a past medical history of gout, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. She presented with a few days of left elbow pain and swelling. The patient said this, the pain started two days ago and has progressively gotten worse. It's limiting her range of motion and she can't bring her elbow to her mouth. In addition, it feels swollen and warm. She denies any recent uh, trauma to the elbow and does have a history of gout, but never in the elbow. She denies any other symptoms, no fevers, chills, shortness of breath or chest pain. She's been taking a leave without relief. As you can see her, here, her uh, inflammatory labs, ESR and CRP are elevated with a normal white blood cell count of eight. So the ED actually performed an ultrasound, ultrasound guided arthrocentesis for this patient and um, conveniently uh, provided this picture of the synovial fluid in her chart. We were consulted after the aspirate resulted, which showed a nucleated cell count of 60,000 cells with over 77, with 77% PMNs and positive crystals. So recall that qu classically, the white blood cell count over 50,000 cells would mean that this patient is, has septic arthritis and we should take them to the OR for a washout. However, after discussing uh, this case with my attending on call, and given the fact that she had a history of gout, the patient uh, subsequently stated that she felt like this was a gouty attack and wanted to go home. We opted to DC her from the ED with strict return precautions. Her cultures never grew anything and she has not returned to the ED with worsening symptoms to date. So we all, many of us use this 50,000 synovial white blood cell count cutoff, so to speak, um, but where does this come from? And the, the earliest uh, reference that I could trace this back to is actually the American Rheumatologic Association who periodically releases guidelines on best practices uh, for rheum rheumatologic disorders, including infectious arthritis. And so while many studies cite this paper or another review article that references this paper um, as a rationale for uh, using the 50,000 cell cutoff, uh, the primary source itself doesn't actually offer any evidence or validation of this value. Uh, yet, unfortunately, it was somehow widely adopted and put into practice. And so one of the major problems with the cell count threshold is it's based on the occurrence of inflammatory arthropathy or septic arthritis as independent and non-simultaneous diagnoses. Meaning if crystals are negative and the synovial white blood cell count is greater than 50,000 cells, the positive predictive value of the test is high in favor of the diagnosis for septic arthritis. However, as you can see by the titles of all of these studies, we run into problems using this threshold when crystals are positive, which are 100% diagnostic of gout. So when faced with an aspirate result, such as this, the one in the case example with positive crystals and synovial white blood cell count over 50,000 cells, inductive reasoning based on our current beliefs makes us wanna to jump to the conclusion that the patient probably has arthropathy and infection, right? Not exactly. So a recent study out of Wake Forest and Duke sought to answer uh, this question and evaluated the accuracy of diagnosing septic arthritis using the typical synovial white blood cell count up of 50,000 cells in the setting of true positive crystalline arthropathy. So they uh, defined a true positive diagnosis of septic arthritis as one with a positive culture on the initial joint aspirate or a positive syno synovial tissue culture obtained during a subsequent surgical IND when applicable. A total of 358 aspirates were included in the study. 149 of them were negative for crystals and had a negative culture. 160 aspirates were positive for crystals only, which is diagnostic for gout or pseudogout, and three patients had a positive cultures and positive crystals. So only three patients um, of the study um, had, had positive crystals and um, positive culture. And so additionally, 47 of the 160 aseptic aspirates with crystals had a synovial uh, white blood cell count of over 50,000 cells. So out of the 50 patients with positive crystals and synovial white blood cell count over 50, only three of them had a positive culture, indicating a concomitant infection. 
So this tells us a few things. One, that septic arthritis in the setting of positive crystals does occur, but the overwhelming majority of the patients with positive crystals and synovial white blood cell counts over 50,000 were aseptic. Finally, while a third of the aspirates with positive crystals were aseptic yet had a white blood cell count over 50,000, two thirds of them, i.e. the majority, uh, were less than 50,000. So the threshold values uh, that were provided in that initial table for synovial white blood cell count aren't inaccurate per se, but we have to look beyond those values for every patient in order to avoid making over-interventional treatment decisions for these patients. So upon review of other papers, uh, the finding of um, three out of 50 uh, patients with both septic arthritis and positive crystals is fairly consistent throughout the literature. It's also worth noting that while reviewing the literature, uh, Newman criteria were often cited as a study's definition of septic arthritis and used for the inclusion criteria. The Newman criteria include a positive culture from joint aspirate or blood, um, direct identification of the microorganisms in synovial fluid tissue or elsewhere, i.e. a positive gram stain, or a strong clinical suspicion without any other more reasonable explanation. While these criteria are useful for research, little evidence exists to support the routine use uh, for diagnosis to guide treatment. Okay, so what, so what tests are shown with evidence to be helpful in NJSA diagnosis? Let's start again from the top with history and physical exam. So while each risk factor in isolation only has a modest impact on the likelihood ratio uh, of septic arthritis, the overall risk rises as the number of risk factors increases, which is one of the reasons why we should, we should ask patients about them. So many patients with septic arthritis will possess uh, several of these risk factors. For example, patients with rheumatoid are at an increased risk um, for septic arthritis due to increased joint damage, poor skin condition, and immunosuppression combined. So what about serum blood tests? While CBC and CRP and ESR are often obtained, the results of these tests will not sufficiently lower the post-test probability to influence the decision to obtain synovial fluid. The serum white blood cell count may be elevated, but the sensitivity ranges from 42 to 90% with a likelihood ratio, a positive likelihood ratio of only 1.4. And similar things can be said about ESR and CRP. And interestingly, um, a few new serum blood tests such as procalcitonin and TNF-alpha have shown a lot of promise with the most recent diagnostic accuracy review uh, from 2021 summarizing that both labs have a, ne have a negative likelihood ratio of less than 0 0.1, meaning that results less than the values listed can significantly lower the suspicion of septic arthritis. Finally, as mentioned before, blood cultures should be obtained in patients with septic arthritis as they can help identify bacterial etiology of infection, which is especially helpful if all signs and symptoms point to septic arthritis, but the synovial fluid culture results negative. Some additional tests uh, other than cell count and differential that can be performed on synovial fluid are listed here. Gram staining is fast and specific, but not very sensitive with 40 to 55% sensitivity to detect bacterial infection. Synovial protein glucose and leukocyte esterase may sound familiar to some of you uh, in the arthroplasty world, which can all be tested using the chemical test strip and have been used uh, to detect infection in the urine for decades, and recently were validated to be suited for other bodily fluids such as uh, CSF and synovial fluid as well. Glucose um, may be significantly lower with joint inflammation and infection, which is also seen uh, in CSF analysis as well, and protein can be increased with bacterial infection. One of the most promising uh, val uh, lab values is synovial lactate, which has been suggested to have the best diagnostic accuracy of all the synovial fluid markers in septic arthritis but it's important to recognize that there's actually two different isomers of lactate that exist in the body, D-lactate produced by bacteria and L-lactate produced by humans. And this distinction can be, has to be made by the lab and therefore it may not be feasible for all institutions to perform. Calprotectin is a biomarker produced by neutrophils and monocytes and released into the bodily fluids as a result of inflammation or infection. And this has been promising as well. So the combination of leukocyte esterase and a negative glucose is the most suggestive of septic arthritis. And this test is also commonly used to aid in the diagnosis of PJI. So when using the, the dipstick test routinely in clinical practice, uh, Colvin and colleagues found that the greatest limitation was the inability to accurately read the test result when the synovial fluid sample was bloody, 
which reportedly occurs in about 17 to 29% of samples, which is unfortunate. Given it's a, a colometric test set, imagine that there is also some subjective discrepancy um, when analyzing the test strips um, between observers. And so these two tests that, uh, with negative likelihood ratio of less than 0.1 are actually the ones I'm most excited about. And this is because in the setting of infection where culture is considered the gold standard for diagnosis, uh, that tells me it's the most specific test that we have, meaning that our best chance of making the most accurate diagnosis quicker um, is to order quality screening tests, which is exactly what these are. So when ordered a synovial fluid, uh, when ordered a synovial fluid calprotectin value less than 52, or a synovial white blood cell count less than 15,000, both have a high sensitivity and low uh, negative likelihood ratios, indicating that if the test results below these values, we can more confidently rule out the diagnosis of septic arthritis. Is there any role for imaging? The short answer is not really. Um, radiographs are typically obtained of the affected joint to rule out some of the differential diagnoses we mentioned before and may demonstrate some soft tissue swelling or joint effusion. But basically, uh, the findings are non-specific. So in summary, while septic arthritis is sometimes easily diagnosed, there are many situations in which the diagnosis can be confounded by underlying or concomitant disease processes or pathologies. This statement is from a rheumatology association study in response to multiple attacks according to the accuracy of the 50,000 cell threshold cutoff. There's a striking paucity of high quality evidence upon which the base to base guidelines on the management and of the hot swollen joint. Ultimately, the diagnosis of septic arthritis rests on the opinion of, of a clinician experienced in the assessment of musculoskeletal disease. And this may sound disheartening, but we, as orthopedic surgeons, are the experienced MSK clinicians they're referring to. And the reason our opinion matters is because the diagnosis of NJSA can't be chalked up to a simple algorithm where diagnosis hinges on uh, less than or greater than 50,000 white blood cells. But don't lose hope yet because uh, we'll continue to talk about uh, some better ways to approach the diagnostic workup. So systemic antibiotics are typically something that everybody agrees on should be started after a, a suspected diagnosis of septic arthritis. In animal models and subsequently in clinical studies previously showed that antibiotics reach synovial fluid concentration in, um, higher than the minimal inhibitory concentration required for effective treatment against infection, meaning that the concentration of antibiotics reaches the synovial fluid uh, is in theory high enough to effectively attack the bacteria there. Additional animal studies have also shown that earlier administration of systemic antibiotics is protected of, car of cartilage loss. Yet it is rare for systemic antibiotics in isolation to cure joint sepsis. So why is it? Another rabbit animal model, a study indu induced and treated septic arthritis in rabbit knees and then treated with intramuscular cloxacillin. Treatment was started about 48 hours after established infection, but before the onset of irreversible car cartilage changes as determined by a previous natural history study I showed earlier. All the joints exhibited negative cultures after two days of therapy. So obviously they were excited thinking that infection had been eradicated. But unfortunately after rabbit sacrifice, they used the, their histologic grading scale I mentioned earlier to document cartilage damage. And unfortunately they saw destructive cartilage changes despite the negative cultures. However, they stated that the damage occurred at a slower rate relative to the findings of the natural history study, where no treatment was initiated at all. So what's the explanation for this? Recall that our basic anatomy recap from earlier uh, stated that chondrocytes receive 100% of their nutrients and therefore drugs via diffusion. Therefore, just because the synovial fluid is reaching a concentration that's above the MIC, it's clearly not enough in isolation to completely eradicate the infection. Otherwise, there would be no role for surgical intervention. So you can see in the diagram on the right, provided by Dr. Whiteside, an arthroplasty surgeon, well published in PJI literature, gives an example of uh, the time-related um, progressing of IV antibiotic concentrations, namely that they produce a concentration of antibiotics that is above the MIC for only a brief period of time. So since antibiotics alone are not sufficient to eradicate septic arthritis, clinicians typically select one of three ways to manage it. Recurrent arth arthrocentesis, also known as serial aspirations, arthrotomy, or arthroscopy, which has increased in popularity over the past decade. How do these treatment options compare? So serial aspirations versus surgical management in general. Uh, both of these studies um, that I'll discuss here were retrospective in nature, uh, and they compared 
adults with monoarticular septic arthritis with no significant baseline or demographic differences found between the patient groups and compared medical versus surgical management. So both treatment strategies were routinely employed at those institutions prior to the beginning of the study. And no significant difference um, was found in the treatment results. Similarly, in this study out of the Connecticut VA hospital, um, both patients uh, of, that were treated medically and surgically, medically um, being that of repeat serial aspirations, had similar, uh, similar results with similar percentages uh, resulting in poor outcomes and full recovery. So a few issues that I have with the studies comparing the two treatments is that most patients who underwent surgical intervention had on average two or more aspirates obtained prior to the surgery. So it sort of makes me wonder if they failed medical management, which warranted the surgery, or if there is some clinical context that we're missing uh, by performing the study in a retrospective fashion. So are these two treatment strategies equal? Personally, I think that's sort of asking the wrong question uh, since reality is not usually so black and white. And I think that each strategy likely has its place in practice and that we should keep our minds open to both options depending on the scenario. A 2004 review on this topic nicely detailed the practical advantages of each approach when saying, with surgical lavage, direct visualization permits debridement of lysis of, of adhesions and high volume lavage of joint is possible. Proponents of surgical approach contend that lavage is necessary to adequately remove proteolent material from the infected joint and thus protect the articular car cartilage from rapid destruction. Conversely, surgical lavage is an invasive procedure, exposes the patient to risks of anesthesia and is a one-time procedure that cannot accommodate ongoing purulent synovial effusions. In contrast, the surgical lavage, daily arthrocentesis is not invasive and can be performed repeatedly until the infection is cleared. For example, a study by Stake et al. in 2020 found that patients who had concurrent systemic infection had 12-fold higher odds of needing a repeat washout compared to those without a concurrent infection. Similar findings uh, to the medical versus surgical debate were found with arthroscopy and arthrotomy. A study out of Iowa more recently looked at arthroscopy and arthrotomy in NJSA of the shoulder specifically. They found that there was um, no significant difference in the risk of 30-day adverse events uh, between the two groups and that arthroscopic debridement appeared to be a safe alternative to open debridement for septic arthritis of the shoulder. And what about acidivectomy? Um, basically, the, the studies that uh, discuss acidivectomy often use this GACTER criteria. And unfortunately, there was no uh, significant validation of this criteria um, that I could find. And so this question will remain unanswered for now. So back to these current beliefs um, and the role on tr in treatment and outcomes. The commonly cited reason for why NJSA is an orthopedic emergency is that bacteria and wet blood cell infl inflammatory products destroy cartilage within minutes to hours. All the scientific studies to date on this commonly taught principle are basic science in vitro and animal studies. Interestingly, similar to the open fractures need to be treated in less than six hours rule, the emergent nature of septic arthritis has actually not been demonstrated in any clinical studies, and only a handful of studies have, have even investigated it. So when considering and evaluating um, our treatment success, starting with serial aspirations, um, basically I, I thought to ask what's considered a failure? Is it when serial aspirations uh, are, are performed but you have to resort to surgery if symptoms persist beyond a few days or perhaps you proceed with an urgent surgery uh, without any specific plans to return but the patient gets worse and not better clinically prompting an unplanned trip back. Planning to treat surgically um, by arthroscopic IMD, but then having to convert to arthrotomy if findings are, are too severe. And finally, what if you rush a patient to the OR, um, perhaps in the setting of a high synovial wet blood cell count and positive crystals, but intraop findings are pretty benign and all their cultures are negative. These are all hypothetical questions, of course, but they are important to th and worth thinking about because as we proceed with future research on this disease process to further clarify the optimal treatment strategy, the definition of treatment failure uh, for each treatment arm can dictate the outcomes. And so a commonly cited mode of treatment failure is the need for an unplanned repeat debridement following surgical intervention for septic arthritis. The study out of JBJS in 2015 showed that 62% of septic joints uh, were managed effect effectively with a single surgical debridement, meaning that 38% of them um, underwent an unintended repeat surgery. 
As you can see here, multiple studies evaluated uh, the same mode of treatment failure as well, with anywhere from 12 to 48% failure rates. Unfortunately, few studies have, have reported or investigated the long-term sequelae following any treatment modality. Again, um, a commonly cited mode of treatment failure is the need for unplanned repeat operations, and many have found that there's risk factors that are associated with that, um, from time of symptom onset um, to uh, an open IND to a MRSA um, positive culture. The studies that reported sequelae were in between 16% and 63% of cases with an average rate of about 35% um, of patients that still had uh, sequelae at about one year despite adequate treatment. And four of these studies uh, reviewed by Lopper and colleagues uh, cited a delayed diagnosis as a reason for sequelae. However, as you can see, the definition of delayed varies in each study and typically doesn't um, include minutes to hours, but, but days to weeks. So whether or not septic arthritis is a true emergency remains to be seen. Um, the statement is frequently cited without citations and the papers that do refer to it are often um, referencing reviews that reference the late sequelae of missed septic arthritis um, that were often performed a long time ago. So the rationale for immediate lavage appears to be based primarily on, on animal treatment and basic science studies at this time. And the evidence in humans remains to be seen. And unfortunately, mortality and treatment success or lack thereof has remained pretty stable over the past few decades. So where do we go from here? In terms of diagnosis, I think we would benefit from creating and validating a set of criteria specific for adult NJSA. Additionally, we could use additional tests, serum and synovial for better accuracy prior to culture results. Treatment wise, we could look into using other medications, including anti-inflammatories and possibly corticosteroids as well as these drugs have been shown to reduce collagen loss by an, an additional 50% compared to antibiotic treatment alone. Additionally, we could look at using intraarticular injections. We use these already for many other rheumatologic disorders such as um, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, and even gout. So why not consider using intraarticular antibiotic injections as well? Dr. Whiteside, an arthroplasty surgeon focused on PJI research and others mainly in the vet veterinary literature have advocated strongly for intraarticular infusions or antibiotics. Uh, this provides a much higher local antibiotic concentration, hundreds of times greater during their peak dose relative to the MIC of antibiotic concentration, um, which remains high locally during the trial phase as well. Dr. Andrew Chen, a CMC trauma fellow alumni, initiated a study at UNC to actually look at the efficacy of intraarticular antibiotics and the concurrence with serial joint aspirates for treatment of NJSA. A senior member of their trauma faculty was already using this treatment strategy routinely and with apparent success, which made it low-hanging fruit for a retrospective review, which they initiated. Dr. Xu, one of our CMC trauma attendings, has been in touch with Dr. Chen regarding the study and recently introduced their protocol into his own practice. So a middle-aged male with a recent diagnosis of COVID pneumonia was readmitted for general fatigue and bilateral elbow pain. He had a right elbow aspirate consisting of eight cc's of yellow cloudy fluid, 103,000 white blood cell counts, and 86% PMNs, as well as positive crystals and a negative gram stain. The left aspirate looked about the same, except it only had 51,000 crystals. Oops, sorry. However, his exam wasn't that concerning clinically, and he had cleared his pneumonia, was afebrile, and blood cultures were negative, and the pain about his elbow just seemed a little off. So after discussing the case with uh, Dr. Shu, we decided to go ahead and repeat the aspirations on both elbows and also inject antibiotics intraarticularly at that time. So we, I repeated the aspirate a day later and uh, which showed a substantially decreased uh, synovial white blood cell count, um, which was still both positive for pseudogout crystals. For each elbow that I aspirated, I also lavaged it with 10 cc's of normal saline and followed by an injection of 10 cc's of tobramycin, 40 milligrams and 20 mLs of normal saline per the UNC protocol. Clinically, this patient improved within 48 hours. It was discharged from the hospital. Ultimately, cultures were negative for both elbow aspirates. So most of us have seen the widespread spectrum of severity to rule out NJSA and uh, rule out NJSA consults. In order to decide on the best possible treatment plan for NJSA, I believe it would be helpful to stratify patients according to a severity spectrum, such as the, that seen here. 
I think the greatest opportunity for change exists in the moderate and unstable patient groups highlighted in yellow, where there's moderate concern for uh, patients with those with positive crystals and with severely elevated synovial white blood cell count. So we're uncomfortable doing nothing, but something about the clinical picture and risk factors don't quite make sense. Additionally, on the other end of the spectrum, um, systemically ill patients with sepsis um, with a source other than in the infected joint have a high risk of repeat washout and have the most to lose from multiple surgeries, i.e. they're medical, medically frail. So we could perform repeat aspirations with intraarticular injections of antibiotics until the source is controlled. If a patient still is having issues with the joint after that, we could consider additional surgical intervention. And a patient um, on the right end of the spectrum was, was seen and uh, an inter intraarticular injection was performed on him as well. Uh, and he was a 76 year old male that had a past medical history of AML and was a status post liver transplant. Um, they had initiated antibiotics prior to consulting us, uh, resulting in the uh, aspirin that you see here. And since we don't expect the, uh, the blood or the synovial fluid cultures to result positive based on how long he's been getting antibiotics, uh, repeat aspirations as well as local antibiotics may be a good option for him while he's recovering in the hospital. So in summary, um, for diagnosis, uh, I think some of the key points are to pay attention to the risk factors and form a pretest probability. Don't be dependent on the 50,000 uh, white blood cell synovial fluid number and order tests with low negative likelihood ratios to help you rule out NJSA before the cultures result. Prioritize culture and not cell count if a low amount of synovial fluid is is aspirated. If you're worried, you can always admit to medicine for observation and IV antibiotics if warranted while waiting for the culture to result. Treatment-wise, um, aspirating and initiating systemic antibiotics or local antibiotics uh, is likely beneficial to do as soon as possible. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we have a high rate of treatment failure and morbidity despite adequate treatment, and I think we can do better. We've been reporting similar subpar results and trying various versions of the same treatment strategy in a one treatment fits all fashion. And I think it might be time to try to stratify the patients and try something new. Whether or not uh, septic arthritis is a true emergency remains to be seen. Basic science studies in vitro, in vivo, uh, in vitro and in vivo animal models demonstrate rapid cartilage destruction after uh, initiation of infection. However, the clinical significance of the time to surgical intervention is unclear. I want to say a special thank you to the following people. I'm sorry, I went a little bit over time. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, obviously, a, a pretty, uh, pretty big topic with lots of confounding uh, variables in diagnosis and treatment. But uh, appreciate your insight and your review of the topic. And probably because of time, we'll uh, go ahead and cut things short. But thanks again, and thanks to everybody for uh, attending Grand Rounds this morning.